Alrighty, so first big review of the season, and like I said before, in terms of this season of how I do the review, I'm going to split it into two parts. There is no way in the world I'm going to do those big reviews, especially I know next week we're going to have all 14 games. That's going to be happening on Saturday. No way in hell I am going to do a review of looking at every single game because that just takes way too long. But in terms of some of these busy action that we saw on Saturday night, well, you know MLS is truly back when you have some games that just completely goes off the rail. Uh, Chaos basically re reigns supreme in some of these games and some peak MLS and after dark kind of moments. And then, of course, you will know that MLS is definitely back when we have tons of controversial call and tons of blown calls uh, by Pro and VAR. And especially in terms of the big talking point, of handball because there were some of these games and we'll definitely get to one of those games that definitely had an uh, effect of the resort of how that is going to be a big talking point as the season goes along but with that being said let us actually get into the first game which is Atlanta versus the San Jose Earthquakes and I'm not gonna lie this one hurts this one really hurts with the way that I thought the Quakes play a perfect road game in this one up until uh, in the 90th minute, they were leading in this one. It looked like they were going to seize it out. And then stoppage time happened. And that the Quakes basically remember that they are the Quakes. And that they finished dead last last season for a reason. And also, Tiago Amada happened for Atlanta United. I mean, he basically uh, showed you why he's a, he's a World Cup winner for Argentina in this game. And why he is worth the amount that Atlanta United uh, pay him uh, just a season ago. But in the first half, uh, Guzman missed jump on a header after Daniel whips on it. I thought it was some shaky moment for the Quakes backline, and especially uh, Daniel, you know, I was a little bit surprised seeing him in goal in this one. I thought Mark Sinkowski uh, would be in goal this one, but Luchi Gonzalez uh, believed in the, the new signing, and we'll see whether if that is going to continue. But in the 12th minute, the Quakes get the opening goal. It's Jeremy Abosi scoring from... Espinoza and Rodriguez. By the way, this is actually the first goal out of all the the 7.30 p.m. Eastern, 4.30 p.m. Pacific game. And that, yeah, this was a great goal from the Quakes. Great work from them on the, the attacking end. Espinoza puts in a killer pass, which we've seen him done time and time again. And he finds the Bobos see there. I mean, this won't be the last time. We're going to talk about that combination about, uh, of this Quakes attack. But yeah, they take a one nothing lead on the road. Espinosa then fires it wide from close range. And I thought the Atlanta defense, they looked like a deer in the headlight. I mean, every time when the Quakes were going on the, the attack, they just looked like a step slower. And they were ball watching at times. Uh, Guzan then denied Ibovici from close range as the Quakes attack. Again, they look absolutely on fire whenever they go on the, the quick transition. Uh, though Arujo did blast one into the stands before in the 38th minute against the run of play. A penalty was given to Atlanta as Murray handball into the box. Now, despite the fact that, as I'll talk about some controversy with handballs uh, in this in this review and also in part two of the, the review, because we also saw some games in part two of my review that has controversial handball call, this one was not. Uh, I think this was the, the right call. I mean, Paul Murray, he, you, you cannot just simply uh, slide down and put your hand in an unnatural position and handball that one. So, yeah, in the end, it was the right call. Uh, so Luis Arujo had a chance to step up to get Atlanta the equalizer, but he missed that one wide. And I have a feeling that is probably the last time he's going to take penalty for Atlanta United because, yeah, anytime when you miss the, the target on a penalty, yeah, you are going to get a lot of scru scrutiny from your teammate and especially uh, from Gonzalo Pineda. But uh, I thought that was a get out of the jail car from the Quakes because as much as if they would have scored that tied the game It would have been against the, the run of play because I thought the Quakes were the better team in that one Yeah, the Quakes got got away with still those kind of mental mistakes. I've seen seen happen on, on the defensive end uh, Danielle then denied Conway from long range before Cal hits one right to Guzan uh, Guzman then blasted wide from close range before Arujo with fires at wide from long range and Atlanta started again Getting some ch chances. I mean, for the first 40 minutes, they were kind of shut down uh, in this one. But they were starting to getting some great A chances. And uh, I thought the Quakes need to ride out this storm, which thankfully they were able to do so. Because uh, Amada would then hits one to Danielle in the 44th minute. And we had to have time with the Quakes leading one nothing. 
In the second half, uh, Bovisi would put one wide from long range before Guzan would deny Espinoza from close range. Brad Guzan was huge in, in this one, and he shows you why Atlanta United really miss him from la last season because he made some big save uh, to keep this team in this game as long as possible. Uh, Amada then, then puts it wide from close range, and it feels like the next goal is coming soon because I, there was definitely chances for both of these teams. And I also had a feeling that one nothing probably isn't going to be enough for the Quakes, especially with the way that this team has never had a good record in terms of keeping clean sheet, especially on the road. I didn't think one nothing was going to be enough for this team. Uh, Arujo then puts it wide from long range before Amada does the same thing. This time he puts it high. Uh, and again, despite the fact that Atlanta was throwing the kitchen sink and it looks like it's all hands on, on deck for the Quakes, a lot of these chances for Atlanta was outside side the, the box, and a lot of these were, were not even on, on target, and that just kind of shows you maybe the, the 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 shooting boots are just not there for Atlanta United in this one. Uh, Lennon then hits it wide from close range in the 87 minute, and then we go into stoppage time, and this is when the Quakes basically had, had a meltdown, and this is when the Tiago Amada show began. Uh, in the second minute of stoppage time, uh, Amada would score here to give... Uh, Atlanta the equalizer certainly a contention for goal of the week and probably the goal of the week knowing Atlanta United fans love to vote that though I will say that they, they might have a difficult decision to choose which Amada go because this one was definitely great from him uh, hitting an absolute screamer from 27 yards out that came off the post and into the back of net but there's definitely a lot of question in terms of defense being from the Quakes especially from uh, Grezo part which you know I thought Carlos Grezo played well in this one, it definitely shows you why the Quakes, of course, got him for a record transfer fee. But here, he was just too slow in terms of clo closing down. And I also wonder whether or not did he did that injury that he, he suffered early in the second half uh, kind of bother him. Because in the second half, he did look like he was going to have to be forced to, to sub off. And there was a re really nervous moment uh, as a Quakes fan, seeing how, how your record si signing uh, already went down in the first game. And... I wonder did that had anything to do with it because yeah I mean that that was not great defending from him and definitely not great defending from the Quakes and yeah that ties the game up at one apiece and then in the eighth minute of stoppage time oh uh, why not Tiago Amada once again again uh do do another incredible goal because this time he scored from an, an absolute banger of a, a free kick to give Atlanta a, a 2-1 lead and I, I just also had a feeling when that free kick was about to take in I thought Amada was going to score. I mean, the quality that Thiago Amada has had, especially from long range, he's probably one of the best long range uh, goal scorer in, in this league. Yeah, there there was a chance that the, the Quakes were probably going to blow it, and they did it indeed in this one. As in the end, Atlanta come from behind very late in this game to win 2-1 and really steal one against the, the Quakes. Shots in this one, 20 shots committed to 10 that the Quakes had. Five shots on goal for the four that the Quakes had. Three shots off target for the 11 that Atlanta has. Three shots that was blocked compared to the four that Atlanta has. And possession-wise, 60% possession compared to the 40% possession that the Quakes has in this one. And, you know, despite the fact that I said before this one definitely staying for the, the Quakes, I think there's definitely some positive coming out of, of this game. I think when you look at how they play in this one, especially in the first half, I thought the Quakes definitely looked like like uh, a, a better better team than what we saw Uh uh, last season now obviously they just need to, to figure out in terms of finishing game and this is also why I think you know for Luchi Gonzalez he better not turn into another Adrian Heap because what I saw in this performance especially in the second half was very similar to what I see with Minnesota and Adrian Heap just ki kind of decided to to bunker in and hope for the best to hold on to the one nothing lead and I will say that it if it wasn't for for the the, the great Am Amada Goal, maybe the Quakes would have walked away with all three points. But again, this is why I always talk about with teams where you just simply cannot just bunker in and and, and just pray that you can hold on to get get a resort like like that. I mean, you, I mean, um, you know, occasionally you might see some teams are able to survive that, but at the at the the same same time, you know, you you gotta at least had some possession and the Quakes just weren't able to do that. I mean, Atlanta was just pushing uh, so hard in this one that I just had a feeling. Eventually, they, the the Quakes would not only draw points in this one, but maybe be they're gonna go full full Quakes and and blow this game and lose this one, which is exactly what happened in this game. But that being said, uh, moving on in the next match is Charlotte versus New England. So the refs basically showed the Quakes how to hold on 
to a one nothing lead though i will say this uh this game looked like for a long time was heading to a a uh, no 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 draw i mean both of these teams just could not finish in this game but at last the refs grab a late late winner in the 89th minute and that's all the difference of them getting a huge three points on the road to start the the season now in the first half first of all got to talk about the the wonderful tribute for for anton walk before the game and i also forgot to mention it in this game between Atlanta and the quakes where they also did a wonderful tribute for anton walks because you know uh anton walks is also a huge part to the Atlanta united community especially of him being one of the the player that was part of that expansion season but obviously re more recently uh he means a lot to Sh charlotte too because of the way that he, he was uh with this team and it's you know still very tragic to see see the sudden loss of anton walks and that i think they did an amazing tribute before the, the game paying uh, tribute to to their their teammate there but that being said uh in the first 20 minutes of this game it was not so great because there was not much that was happening with zero shot through the first 20 minutes I mean you would have literally only uh, missed the first 20 minutes in this one and you wouldn't have ha have seen seen much and that's kind of the thing with a lot of these games where a lot of these games there really isn't a lot of fast start because of the way that you know this is the first time for every single team back into competitive action and it's going to be tough, tough, you know, to try and to really go gun ho uh, from minute one when you're playing a competitive game for the first time of what seems like four or five months for some of these teams. Uh, but the first shot of the game did came in the 20th minute as one of their new signing for Charlotte, Ashley Westwood, with flash one wide from close range. Uh, Ciciago would deny Jones from close range. Uh, the game started to kind of picked up, but still very few chances, and neither goalkeeper was really tested uh, in the remaining part of the first half, and as a result, they had to have time scoreless between both of these teams. Now, in the second half, uh, things did eventually pick up. In fact, Kessler actually came came close of getting the opening goal for New England as he struck the post on an, a free header. But Romney was able to get the, the rebound there, but he only hits it right to Sesiaga. Uh, Tuluma then hits a long-range effort that just go wide, and it did not miss by much. I mean, that's the thing about Bill Tuluma and the fact that he can definitely hit, hit a long-range effort effort especially during this time with the portland timbers last season uh but ciciaga would then deny barrero from close range i thought this it was a good game for pablo ciciaga and and rightfully so because i had a feeling that he may be the the, the guy that will be be between the sticks even when colleen uh, is back in, in with this team but in the 79th minute uh vargas would puts it high from long range and i thought the game's off for grabs because now both of these teams were starting to get some chances but and either of these teams get their finishing right so that they can get that crucial opener and maybe the winner of this game. Uh, Shinichi Shiki tried to do so, but he hits one right to Petrovic. Uh, Rennex then hits it wide from close range. But then in the 89th minute, we finally have the opening goal and what turns out to be the winning goal of this game. As Henry Kessler score a rare goal for New England to give the refs a 1-0 lead. That was not great defending from Charlotte. And especially on Bill Tuluma part where he was trying to cut that one out but instead of just me maybe cut that one one out and go behind for a corner he puts that one right into pass of henry kessler which i gotta give henry kessler some credit i mean you know as a defender that's definitely looked like a striker goal with the way that he hits you don't see a lot of defenders able to hit it so sweetly like what kessler did in that one but yeah that gives the refs a one nothing lead uh vargas then looks to try to get an instant response for charlotte but he had Hits one onto the post. I mean, Charlotte was definitely pushing Shing Har in stoppage time, trying to do what Atlanta did to the the Quakes. Uh, Capetti then heads it straight to Petrovic. It was a very quiet game for Enzo Capetti, and I have a feeling, you know, he's probably going to be one of those players that we've seen before in the league. Where in the beginning, it's not going to be easy. It, you know, whenever you have have big name players, especially players that that was bought in for big amount of money in South America, it's 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 really really easy to just judge them by one performance and say yeah that's a waste of money and while that kind of seems like is the case if you judge by that i, I do think capetti is going to get get better and he once the he gets to know his teammate a little bit and start to get the feel of mls play i, I think he is going to be a, a great number nine but you know in this game really quiet throughout this one not really really 
uh, very impacted in this one. Uh, but Charlotte was definitely throwing the kitchen sink to get the late equalizer. Schwedetsky tried to do so, but he heads it wide from close range. But in the end, New England hang on to win one nothing in this one. Shots in this one, 15 shots apiece for both of these teams. Five shots on Goku for the four that Charlotte has. Four shots off target for the eight that Charlotte has. Three shots that was blocked for the six that New England has. And possession-wise, 54% possession compared to the 46% possession that the refs has in this game. Like I said, huge victory. Uh, this is for the, the Revs knowing how big this season is. But for Charlotte, you know, I am pretty sure they're going to be very frustrated with the fact that they had the chances to win this game. And that I will also say that, you know, for Charlotte, I know this was an emotional game in, in this one, honoring their late teammate Anton Walks. But it can definitely go both, both ways. I mean, it can go one way where, you know, you can use that as an inspiration and you can push uh, to a victory. But then it can also go the other way where it could be a distraction. And although I don't think it was kind of a distraction this one because I thought Charlotte uh, played good enough to get all three points They just weren't able to figure out their their finishing and worst of all uh, just uh, Some defensive mistake cost them in this game, but that being said uh, moving on in the next match We got FC Cincinnati versus the Houston Dynamo. So this also was not a, not an easy vic victory uh, for the team that was in in favor well I mean, I don't know if the, the Rams were in favor in the game against Charlotte, but sit, definitely in this case for Cincinnati against Houston. I mean, many people thought that this was going to be a thrashing, but no, you know, the, the Dynamo, just like last season. I think the Houston Dynamo last season have shown that improvement that they're not just going to be a walkover uh, whenever they put, when a team, team play, played uh, them when they're on, on the road. And in this game, it shows again where they were in the fight and they could have easily stole a point away from Cincinnati in this one though that being said it wasn't a great start from them in the 19th minute because uh they would concede in the 19th minute with Sergio Santos scoring from Barrio and Wobodo to give Cincinnati a one nothing lead and Steve Clark he definitely want to have that one back I mean you know Sergio Santos I know that that's a huge goal for him because he was snake bitten last season and scoring a goal here has to give him a lot of confidence but that's one that again it kind of hit it right to Steve Clark he should have uh, should have got, got more into that one to palm that one away, but instead, uh, he only got a, got some to some uh, touch to it, and it goes into the net. And yeah, Cincinnati off to a, a dream start in this one. Uh, Vasquez tried to double the lead, but he pulls it wide. But then Karaskia hits one right to Santano before Santano has to call into action again, denying Karaskia in the near post, and then he denied Seba Ferreira from from close. But Tate Schmidt actually get the rebound uh, of of this. This uh, shot that was palmed away from Salatano, but he puts it over the bar. And I thought it was a great response for Houston because, you know, it looked like early this was going to be one-way traffic. It looked like Cincinnati was going to throttle the Houston side. Uh, the Dynamo created some good chances. And if it wasn't for Salatano making some big save, uh, this game could have been a little bit different. Uh, though Barrio did puts it wide from 15 yards out in the 45th minute. But then in the first minute of stoppage time, all those... Good chances that Houston has in the first half finally paid off with a goal as Tate Smith uh, in his debut view with the Houston Dynamo scoring from uh, Herrera to give uh, the Dynamo the equalizer. It was a great delivery there from Hector Her Herrera, but not so great defending from Cincinnati. Like Tate Smith was just wide open in the box. Like you cannot let a man that open in the box and not, not, not uh, uh, reap the consequences of getting conceded. And yeah, Cincinnati paid the price. For that, and we had to have time. All tied up at, at one apiece. And you're thinking, well, you know, Houston might get the momentum in the second. Uh, no. Um, in the 48th minute, Wobodo gives Cincinnati the, the lead back. And um, it's kind of also unfortunate for Houston because it took a wicked deflection. And kind of took a fortunate uh, deflection if you're a Cincinnati fan. And yeah, Cincinnati were back in front in this one. Uh, Moreno then trying to make it 3-1. But he puts it wide from long range. And once again, momentum was with Cincinnati. And they were pushing to try to get the third goal. Though Karaskia's shot took a wicked deflection of itself, but that one goes wide. I mean, Coco Karaskia, a very good game in this one, and he's going to gonna be a, an impact player for for this Houston side. Really like like the fact that they locked him to, to another loan deal because I think he was very good last season for this Dynamo team. Uh, Franco would then pose it just wide from close range before there was a scramble in the Cincy box, uh, which Rizzo and Karaskia blasted high, and then... Three minutes later, on the other end, it was a scramble in the Houston box, but this time Cincinnati 
wasn't able to get a clean look to put it away. Uh, Vasquez was then in on goal, but he missed wide after just a bad turnover for Houston. Just a reminder that this Dynamo defense still sucks. But for Brandon Vasquez, yeah, this was a rough game for him. I mean, I, I think there was a couple of times where if this was just vintage Brandon Vasquez and a guy that was in form like we saw last season, he would at least score a goal or two for the Cincinnati side. Uh, but... I also wrote, will these missed chances come back to haunt Cincy? Because knowing that the Dynamo has had some some good opportunity to get the equalizer, yeah, the, and we've seen this before with, with heartbreaks for, for Cincinnati last season, despite having a, a decent year under Pat Nolan. They ha do have that occasion uh, of blowing late leads at home. Uh, Bart Lowe then puts it into the side netting in the 77th minute before uh, Salatano had to deny him from from long range and it just feels like it's all hands on pump for Cincinnati like Houston was really pushing to try to get the equalizer but fortunately for Cincy they survived and win 2-1 in this one shots in this one 19 shots compared to 14 that Cincinnati has so Houston actually outshot Cincinnati in this one they also outshot them in the shots on goal seven shots on goal for the five that Cincinnati has both team had seven shots off target two shots that was blocked for the five that Houston has and possession wise um, it's actually Houston getting more of the possession, 62% possession compared to 38% possession that Cincinnati has in this game. So, yeah, this is definitely not a game that Pat Nolan will be ha ha happy uh, with, with how, how this turns out. But in the end, I think he was just happy. The fact that his team able to get three points, which was something that was a, a, a struggle for this Cincinnati team. They were not a good home team, team uh, and haven't got as many wins as you think that they should be being so high uh and uh well not really high up but finishing fifth in the eastern conference last season but again for the houston dynamo oh uh, there's no shame in terms of this this was a good good performance and that just, just kind of shows good progress in terms of this deep rebuild that they had i mean all they really need now is for these kind of resort to to turn into wins and i think if they keep playing like this eventually we're going to see those resort and we're eventually going to see them get those those uh wins if they kind of put in the performance that they had in this game against cincinnati but that being said uh moving on in the last game on this board before i switch boards is dc versus tfc so this was one of those games where you know we talk about mls after dark and just some chaotic things that has happened in the game this was one of them because basically the leads switch uh back and forth in the the final uh 30 minutes in this one to a point where yeah uh this is just a game that kind of makes me 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 smile and kind of makes me love this league so much but early on uh, i thought dc was the better side to start this game and they were rewarded by that by getting the opening goal in the 13th minute and it's matthias click scoring on his debut from canals to make it one nothing in favor of dc what a goal that was for matthias click i mean he rifles that one from long range range there uh and yeah that gives uh dc a one nothing lead although insignia he should have equalized for tfc i mean he's definitely going to be thinking about this one as he was was wide open into the back post and the quality that insignia can can bring to the table you don't usually see him miss a sitter like that but even worse news for tfc is in the 34th minute insignia himself was also forced off to be subbed off of what seems like a knee injury and akinona uh had to replace him so here we go. We're already one game into the season, and I already talked about before in the season preview for TFC. This is a team that has history of, of just just so many injuries that kind of rattle you know, this this team, and that's why I, I'm not really as as big as what maybe some people might think TFC is going to be this season. And already we're we're, we're seeing just one game into the season. I mean, I, I wasn't expected that they were going to suffer. Maybe a back-breaking injury just one game in. But yeah, this will be a huge loss for TFC if Lorenzo Insigne is going to be out for, for, for some time. Uh, but in the 40th minute, Pedro Santos would have had a shot that actually took a deflection and struck the post. So unlucky there from Pedro Santos trying to score his first goal for DC United. Uh, Akinona then was through on goal, but he only hits it straight to Tyler Miller. I'm pretty sure a lot of TFC fans would say that if that was Insignia, that one probably would have been Barry because Akinola, again, you know, last season, it was a rough year for, for him. And so far, that kind of effort just kind of sums up why he had a rough season last year. But it was also coming off of a bad turnover from DC United, which, again, just sums up the fact that DC, this is a team that they're going to have those, those problems throughout the season where their defense 
maybe could cost them some games because of bad turnover. But we do head to halftime with DC leading 1-0 in the second half. Uh, Diamante fought the equalize for TFC, but the only problem is he was in an offside position. So the goal was disallowed. Uh, TFC did start the second half the, the better team I, I fought. Uh, and they got a penalty in the 66 minute after L'Oreal was brought down uh, by Encombo. Bone there, which Benedeschi coolly slots that one home to tie the game up at one apiece. Uh, Johnson then punched a coup deep Piaccio volley uh, right to Mateus Click, who just could not put that one away. It was a shaky game for Sean jo Johnson in, in this one. I mean, there was some ner nervy moment in this one for him, including the one in the 79th minute where Santos uh, fired a shot from long range that it was actually bobbled by Johnson. And again, Johnson very lucky. There was no DC player within his range but there's no doubt that dc was started getting the momentum to back like despite the fact they can see the equalizer in the 64th minute they were pushing to try to get that second second go and get the lead back but instead it would be tfc the one that gets the 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 lead for the first time and getting that second go as mark anthony k would give tfc a a 2-1 lead and this came right uh before when miller absolutely robbed benedeski on on a free kick. I mean, Benedeschi put that one in a perfect area, and I have no idea how T Tyler Miller was able to save that one. But unfortunately, that one falls right into Mark Anthony K. And yeah, that entire DC backline just completely stood there and ball watched. And I'm actually surprised that Miller was not livid uh, at that DC backline when that ball went into the back net. Because I, I would. I mean, if I was a goalkeeper and I make a an incredible save like that, only. For my, my defense to just completely fall uh, asleep and not get to the, the rebound out of that. I mean, I, again, you know, Tyler Miller, he's a, he's a cool guy. And, and I, I always would root for him because of what he did for Minnesota United. But yeah, I was kind of surprised of him not just getting absolutely livid by his back line because, because of, of that moment. But TFC would take it. They would lead it 2-1 in this one. But that lead would quickly diminish because just six minutes later, it's Ben Deck. Okay, scoring from Coup de Piaccio from Jahiz to ties the game up at two apiece. And just as you thought that we couldn't get get more crazy thing happening in an MLS game, then in the eighth minute of stoppage time, DC would, would come from behind and, and wins it in dramatic fashion. And guess who? It's uh, Ted Coup de Piaccio, who, you know, he already got an, an assist in this one. He would uh, decided to, to score his first MLS goal in the most dramatic way from Jahiz and, and Fletcher to to give DC a 3-2 lead, and that would be the final score of this game, as the shots in this one, 10 shots committed to 7 that TFC had, 5 shots on goal committed to 4 that TFC had, 4 shots off target committed to 2 that TFC had, both teams had 1 shot that was blocked, and possession-wise, 56% possession, compared to the 44% possession that DC has in this game, and yeah, again, wild, wild game that we saw at Audi Field in this one and again i feel like if this was last season that just kind of maybe sums up why sometimes a wooden spoon dart is a great thing to see because both of these teams finish near the bottom of the eastern conference but also i think after watching this game you can see that this team still have some some work to do i mean for tfc it is pretty clear that that back line is still still not not fixed and that for for dc you know again their their back line also ha makes some, some big mistake but they were bailed out because of the fact that the the attack was just a little bit more clinical enough and get that dramatic win over Toronto in this one. But that being said, I am now going to switch boards and look at the next two two game or the last two game that is part of part number one of looking back at the opening match week of the Saturday action. All right, so moving on into the last two game and first look at Inter Miami versus Montreal. And I gotta say, for Inter Miami, this was a great game for them and. The two goals that they score in this game was definitely coming from a very unlikely source because you would have thought that maybe Joseph Martinez and Campana would get in the scoring action if Inter Miami would have scored. No, turns out that is not the case. Uh, but early on, uh, Calendar would deny Ibrahim after giving the ball uh, straight to him. So yeah, for Drake Calendar, you know, he had a good game in this one, but this was not a great moment for, for Drake Calendar. And by the way, speaking of... Uh, of MOS is back. You know it is back when I talk about some bad mistake by goalkeeping and also some some WTF turnover from from defense because that does happen in this league and it definitely did happen uh, a lot again in the opening week, weeks 
action and yeah for a calendar in this one very fortunate that he got away with it uh but stefan nelly would puts it wide from from long range by the way campana didn't even play in in this one too it was actually stefan nelly the one that that was playing in this one but there was only two shots from both teams through 25 minutes of this game so again it's a bit of a slow start to this game too uh though ibrahim thought that he scored the opening goal for montreal the problem is the flag went up and that means that it is offside and the goal is disallowed. And instead, in the 41st minute, it's Inter Miami, the one that gets the opening goal. Uh, it's Christoph scoring from Gregory and Mota to give uh, Inter Miami a 1-0 lead. So big moment there from Sergei Christoph, not only be, being being uh, scoring the first MLS goal in his career, but becoming the first Ukrainian player to, to score an MOS goal, and you know, you probably know why it's big, because of the current events that is happening around the world, uh, but I also thought that it was not a great moment for Pentamis, again, he just just flapped that one uh, as he was trying to, to punch it away, but just completely missed it, and, and when you a goalkeeper and you don't punch that one away, yeah, you are in no man's land, and, and unfortunately for uh, Pentamis, he didn't get away with that one. Uh, Miami pounced on the, the mistake by the Montreal goalkeeper. And yeah, they were leading one nothing in this one. Though uh, Montreal looked to try to get the equalizer uh, as Calendar denied Kyoto. And then there was a mad scramble in the box, uh, which um, Miami was able to just about clear their way as Montreal could not put it in. But we do head to halftime with Inter Miami leading one nothing over Montreal. In the second half, uh, Calendar would deny Lappin Island from close range before Stefan Nanley uh, would put it wide from, from close. Uh, Pentamis then denied Nagri from long range. And there were some good chances early for both of these teams. Because, you know, for the majority of the first half, there wasn't really that much much chances. Uh, Duke then puts a weak shot right to Pentamis before Calendar would absolutely rob Aaron Herrera and his first first Montreal goal. I mean, it was a big save that was from Calendar because of how good... Herrera puts that that or puts that shot in, but in the 76 minute, that big save from Calendar would turns out to be big because Miami would score their second goal and what turns out to be the goal to kill this game off. And again, it comes from a very unlikely source, Barkland scoring his first ever MLS goal and and in his first ever MLS game. And this was just a classic example of third time is the charm and. When you don't succeed, try and try again. Because Lasseter actually struck the post on the first effort. And then on the second effort, uh, Barglin, well, on his first effort, that is, was clear off the line by Piet. But fortunately for Barglin, it fell right back to him. And he slots it home into the empty net. And yeah, that gave Inter Miami the 2 nothing lead. And then it looked like it was 3 nothing when McVeigh puts it in the back of in the 78th minute. But uh, unfortunately, the flag went up for offside again but there was no doubt momentum was all with Miami like you know they were hungry to try to get that third goal uh Wanyama did have one last chance to give uh Montreal at least a consolation but he hits it right to counter and yeah in the end Miami with a good 2 nothing win to start off the season on the right foot shots in this one 18 shots could be the 14 that Montreal has seven shots on goal for the six that Montreal has four shots off target for the six that Miami has four shots off block for the five that Miami has and possession wise 44 percent possession compared to 56 percent possession that Montreal has in this game and it, you know it wasn't really a bad game for for Montreal and certainly for Hernan Lasada in his debut but yeah you know unfortunately his team was just not clinical enough to get all three points in this one but now moving on in the next match and in the last match of part one of this review Oh boy, this is where we get to, to the, the controversial game between Orlando City versus the Red Bulls. Now, I know a lot of Red Bulls fans would feel like they got robbed in this game. And I, I can see why that is the case. Because the only goal of this game came on a penalty for Orlando City. But probably it shouldn't have been, been called a penalty. And this is where we get to talk about the, the handball rule. And how, again, the way that handball is being being called, at least for, for this week. Uh, this is definitely not a good... Good, good sign uh, of what's to, to come. And again, the handball rule, for a long time, it's been a huge debate in the, 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 the world uh, of soccer or football. You know, there's been debate of exactly is MLS basically implement what FIFA basically decided to do. Well, not FIFA, but what the IFAB decided to do of how handball it is. And there's also just so many times when I watch other leagues play, it's very questionable of how they, they define fine, great 
uh, the ham handball rule, and I think that's going to be something that unfortunately is going to continue to be the case because there's a lot of gray area in terms of how you determine what is a handball and what is not a handball, and it, it kind of propped up again in this one. But early on, uh, the Red Bulls were on the front foot early, and they actually had the first shot of the game as Amaya posed it wide from long range in the 10th minute. Uh, Galese then denied Morgan from close range before Amaya, well, would pose it wide from close. It was all Red Bulls early in this one. I mean, Orlando was just sleepwalking in the first uh, 20 minutes of this one, and they were leading 6 nothing in shots through the first 27 minutes. Uh, there was a huge shout for a penalty from the, the, the wall in the Orlando faithful that was not given. But we do head to half time with, with the game scoreless between both of these teams. Now in the second half, Morgan would pose it wide from close range. But then this is where we get to the controversy. So a penalty was given to Orlando as Neil is handballed that one in the box. And again, when I look back into it, I find it hard to say that that, of course, is a, is a handball. Because the way that that ball kind of, I think it kind of hit his knee and then bounced it back to his hand. And, you know, we, we've seen this before where there's been times when you when you basically hit the ball in, into one part of part of your body or your, your feet and hit it into your hand. It, it can be really hard to, to uh, determine whether it is a, a handball or not. But in this case, I mean, again... I don't think this should have been a penalty. I I, I think this this uh, Nealis was really hard done by this, and they they also did go to VAR to check to see whether or not if that is the case. So that just adds in more fuel in the controversy of what is exactly is clear and obvious to to uh, overturn this call because originally there was no handball that is, and I, looking at that play, I just don't see how that's clear clear and obvious, especially with the way that Nealis kind of tucked his hand, and it's just it's just one that is very un unfortunate. And yeah, in the end, in the end, despite all that, they still called a penalty, and uh, Facundo Torres steps up in the penalty and, and slots it home to give Orlando City a very controversial one nothing lead. Uh, though Torres did try to double the lead, but he missed that one wide uh, before he did try to go for Olympic go, and this was not a bad effort. You know this this how whenever I mention Olympic go attempt, uh, most of the ones have been very close. I mean, yeah, it's kind of impressive. A lot of these players have tried to go for the Olympico goal, and they came very close in terms of scoring it, but here, uh, he missed just why they're on the Olympico attempt. Uh, but I thought Orlando, finally, for the first time, was in control of this game, and the Red Bulls really kind of lost the momentum that they had, had from the first half, and it really kind of happened, and this game kind of turned when that controversial moment happened. Uh, Galese then denied Manuel in the front post in the 85th minute before Manuel had another chance to, to to get the late equalizer for the Red Bulls in the 7 minute of stoppage time but he only hits one right to Galese and despite the fact that there was some nervy moment for the Lions Orlando does hold on to win one nothing in a very controversial way the shots in this one 14 shots compared to just 6 that Orlando City has 4 shots on goal compared to 1 that Orlando City has that sh lone shot on goal was the penalty uh, 2 shots off target for the 6 that the Red Bulls had Four shots that was blocked for the three that Orlando City has in possession wise. 51% possession compared to the 49% possession that the Red Bulls has in this game. And I can understand why uh, a lot of uh, Red Bulls fans are not, not happy because they would say that they were probably the better team for majority part of this game. And I think they they were, but, you know, unfortunately they kind of did lose control of the game uh, a little bit. But, again, it just sucks to see that already we're, we're in week one into the into the the new season and there's already a, a a controversial moment that caused the effect of of the game and i know some might say well at least it happens in week one i i, I don't buy into that i i don't think that that's just clearly sugar coat coating it to a point where there, there's you know i know the the handball rule it's going to be be something that is very very tough but i think there should be a specific thick point where where especially when you go to v var you you gotta sit, simply say that if it's something that is just su in such a gray area and that and are clearly not clear and obvious, don't overturn it. Just simply don't overturn it. Just stick with the the the, the original call. I mean, it's gonna get a lot of Orlando City fans mad and that they're gonna once again throw the conspiracy that that looks like the referee and VAR uh, is against them. But in the end, I think the right call would would have been for them to not call call that as a handball. Uh, and award Orlando City a chance to take the lead, which they eventually did. But there you have it. That is pretty much it in terms of the review of the, the six games as part of the first part 
of the the review for the opening match week of the Saturday action. Uh, I promise you that the, these video is going to get longer because this week I was very fortunate. The fact that that uh, that when I break into two review, I can just do like six games and then four games as part of part number two. But either way, if you guys enjoy this video review let me know in the comments below and make sure you guys leave a like and smash the subscribe button and yeah i of course will see you guys next time